All right. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Welcome to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And this is going to be night two, part two of our uh, study, our look at the Akshayamati uh, Sutra. Um, the questions of Bodhisattva Akshayamati, whose name means inexhaustible wisdom or inexhaustible intelligence, inexhaustible uh, intellect, inexhaustible mind, a lot of different ways to translate Akshayamati. Um, we kind of talked about the name of this Bodhisattva last time. And so I am more or less going to dive us right back into where we were. Of course, I'll catch us up, which is this is a it's a beautiful little sutra from our Ratnakuta, the heap of jewels. This is, I believe, the 45th, the 45th sutra of 49. Um, and the the sutra itself is pretty straightforward forward as far as what's happening. The Bodhisattva, Akshayamati, has come to the Buddha and has asked this very kind of simple question, which is, how do you get enlightened? How do you develop bodhicitta? How do you develop an enlightened mind? Last time, last the first session, I, I spent a, a good deal of time talking about the verb involved in this, which is the verb for initiating or starting or generating or bringing forth. And so the, the real way to read the question of Akshayamati is how does one generate, bring forth or initiate this enlightened mind? And I read the first part of the sutra last time where Akshayamati, who, you know, the name says it all, inexhaustible intellect, he, this Bodhisattva really understands all of the, the wisdom that we, we went over in Manjushri's Pranyaparamita Sutra for eight weeks. He understands all of that wisdom and he lays out, in many ways, a, a, a recap of that Pranyaparamita Sutra of Manjushri that we talked about last time. He lays out the philosophy of this idea of like, well, as I understand it, within real enlightenment, <laughs> there is no mind. That's like, that's delusional that there's no self, there's no mind. But how am I ever going to then understand enlightenment without? So he gets into this paradoxical question of if all of this is empty, if there's no self, all of these things, how do you generate bodhicitta? How do you bod generate or develop a, an enlightened mind? And I just wanted to remind everybody that Akshayamati's question is not sort of like, like he's got his notepad and he's like, all right, how do I get enlightened? And that that's the question. The question is actually much more philosophical. And, well, I mean, it's practical in the sense of getting enlightened or ending suffering in that way. But the question is actually founded on this much more philosophical basis of, again, emptiness, no self. And so he's asking an even more profound question of, then how do you get enlightened? It's like, how, how do you, given everything the Buddha has said, how is this even possible? And so that's where the sutra begins. And the Buddha's answer, so that's the question. And you know, I think I mentioned last time, I don't think I had it written up last time, but this sutra in Sanskrit is also called the Akshayamati Bodhisattva Paripricha Sutra, the questions of Bodhisattva Akshayamati. And so he asks his question, and then the Buddha starts to give the answer, of which I really only scratched the surface last time. So this is definitely going to be right where we pick up from, from last time. But the Buddha's answer is, oh, well, by way of the 10 paramitas. <laughs> That's essentially the answer. It's a little more complicated than that. As I'm always pointing out, these sutras are very careful about their, the way that they speak, the way they use verbs, the way that they use language. We don't need to get into that. 
we're going to talk about the 10 paramitas tonight. These 10 um, practices, observations, virtues, qualities, paramitas, uh, deliverances. So, so you could translate paramita as deliverance. Deliverance by way of giving. And by deliverance, of course, we mean delivered to nirvana, delivered to enlightenment, delivered to the cessation of suffering. And so one could attain that deliverance by way of giving. That's what we talked about last time. By way of moral discipline or shila. That's what we also talked about last time. And I ended last time by kind of you know, pretty quickly running through the paramita of kshanti or patience, patient tolerance, patient endurance. And I actually, so we, we're gonna focus on determination tonight, virya, we'll probably get through to dhyana and pranya. I kind of would actually like to get through all 10 of these, but I don't really have any agenda in that sense. Um, my only agenda is to get to determination so that we cover new ground. But that being said, I am gonna go back and just quickly talk about giving moral discipline and patience, but only within the context of the sutra. So here's the thing about the Dharma doors and, and these, these teachings and these classes. I, I, would, I would love to just do a class on the 10 paramitas. I would love to, to just teach you the, the 10 paramitas and go through them. And of course, that's what I'm about to do. It's what we're doing. But the thing about it is, is that th these 10 paramitas, of course, are standard operating procedure <laughs> for bodhisattvas. You, you know, you go get this sutra, the uh, Vimalakirti sutra, Avatamsaka sutra, Shuram Gama sutra, you name it. They're going to be talking about the 10 paramitas <clears throat> in great detail. The reason why I'm saying this is because this sutra is kind of, kind of very special. It's very beautiful. And so what I was doing last time is I was actually reading from a translation of this sutra that I'm working on because the Buddha gives his answer in this kind of very beautiful poem. And unfortunately, the way the, the standard English translation is, they, they, you know, and this is not surprising, trust me, translating poetry is, it's a whole other thing than translating prose. And so I don't knock them for not trying because I, I totally respect, you know, especially with poetry, you always have to make this decision about whether you're trying to preserve the rhyme and the rhythm and the meter, or if you're trying to preserve the, the meaning and of the words, they of course translate the meaning because that's important. But again, what's interesting is, is that this poem, the Buddha says, well, you know, if somebody wants to get bodhicitta or achieve this enlightened mind, well, then they have to have these meritous roots, virtuous roots of goodness. And not only, I mean, and this is where the poem is, the Buddha saying, to achieve bodhicitta, you have to have these, you know, amazing virtuous roots. Roots like Mount, that are so many, they're like Mount Maru, or like the great earth, or, and so it's this beautiful series of similes, that it's like Mount Maru, that it's like the great earth, and, one of the things that's happening, and it's what I always struggle with, is, is that these are, these are 10 very unique ways to explain the paramitas. These are not the standard ways to, to interpret the paramitas. Now, if you're a total Dharma head, total Sutra head, and, and you're very, very familiar with the 10 paramitas, you get excited when you see a new way of thinking about them because it kind of gives you a greater understanding of them. So I'm always trapped knowing, you know, that you, this might be your first time ever hearing about the 10 paramitas in general. 
and you want me to just explain the 10 and I don't get to go into the finer nuances of the text. And so I'm going to try to do a little bit of both in that way, where I'm going to stick to the just, you know, a good old Dharma lesson or a good old Dharma class on the 10 Paramitas. But I wanted to just quickly go over these three where the Buddha is saying, if someone has virtuous good roots, and the idea here is, is in the original old school, as I call it, version of Buddhism, there was a very surefire way for generating certain roots of merit, punya, that would then ripen or develop into a better rebirth, into a better life, all kinds of ideas of developing these good roots. This, of course, is a Mahayana Sutra. It has a very different understanding of wholesome or good roots, virtuous roots in that way. And so the poem is saying, if someone were to practice giving, and that, and in that sense, they they get those meritoriously good roots, they develop or cultivate those uh, virtuous roots by giving. Well, this is saying that if there is someone who's, who's the level of virtuous roots is so broad and great that it's like Mount Maru, rising above all other mountains, then that is the initial initiation or the first generation of bodhicitta by way of the paramita of giving. I said a lot more about dana and giving last time, so please see part one for that. But then it says that it, then if someone's moral discipline, and so in this sense, it's saying that the virtuous roots that someone would cultivate or attain by way of moral discipline. Well, if someone has virtuous roots from practicing moral discipline and those virtuous roots are like the great earth, able to stabilize all things, that's the second generation or initiation of bodhicitta by way of moral discipline. So it's interesting, of course, because this is sort of, again, it's a poem and it's speaking very poetically about these things. And it's not really giving us the, maybe the concrete thing that we want. It's coming though. So I just wanna kind of share that with you is that these are a beautiful little poem with these like 10 similes to kind of get us a feeling for these paramitas. The third one, that these virtuous roots are, or the cultivation of this patient, that this person, whoever they are, they are resolved and intent, boldly progressing and peacefully receiving afflictions. Like an awesome lion king, master of all beasts, body without fear. That is the third generation of bodhicitta by way of patience. And the most important thing that I can say about patience is, yes, we're talking about sort of, you know, what we would think of as patience, this sort of kind of being able to sit quietly, not anxiously, not, you know, when's this gonna be over, but being patient. Yeah, there, there is definitely a, a virtue to that and a quality of that to Kashanti. But what they're really talking about is this ability to what it what the text says is receive afflictions. And this can be afflictions that arise in your own mind, or it could be the assault of others, people calling you names, whatever it is. And what this paramita is, what this uh practice is about is not allowing anger to arise towards someone that might be uh, assaulting you in some way. 
And I've said this in many Dharma talks, but I always need to say it. This paramita is not about suffering abuse. That is not a virtue. What is a virtue, though, is that if you are in the unfortunate circumstance of being abused in some way, the virtue is not developing anger towards that person. And I mentioned last time that many a great religious teacher has espoused this exact same virtue. But just to start us off tonight, I'd like you to think about, from a Buddhist point of view, that what this is, this patience, this kushanti, this not developing anger towards the other person that might be assaulting you in some way, what the wisdom about this paramita is, is that it ultimately doesn't do you any good to develop that anger. It, it sort of makes the situation worse in a way and in regards to um, suffering abuse, the idea is, is that if you are in the unfortunate circumstance of needing to tolerate somebody's stupidity, somebody else's anger, somebody else's hostility, somebody else's whatever, if you're in the situation that you are, are the recipient of that, the wisdom here is saying, that that anger that you, you know, it's instinctual, but that anger that arises clouds your mind and makes you less capable of getting out of that situation. So again, this is not about suffering abuse. We would like to not suffer abuse. But the idea is, is that wisdom says, or wisdom suggests that you consider what what might be gained from that anger towards the person? And ultimately, of course, the idea is, is nothing is gained from that. And in fact, it's sort of uh, like, a, well, it just perpetuates the problem in that way. So, okay. But again, that's sort of old territory. I'm gonna move on unless there's any, cool. So now we're going to talk about the fourth paramita, virya, determination. I like to translate virya sometimes as drive. Um, it is also sometimes translated even as energy. Uh, the word virya is where we get the English word virile. So there is this sense of strength and power to this paramita, absolutely. Uh, let's check out the sutra, first of all. Uh, fourth is this paramita, or this, um, again, they translate it as a vow. It's not a vow, but fourth is the vow to have overwhelming power to conquer afflictions or defilements, just as Vishnu, the Hindu god Vishnu, Narayana, vanquishes all opponents. This is the fourth generation of bodhicitta by way of virya, determination. They translate it as vigor, vigor. Um, my translation reads that if someone's accumulation of virtuous meritous roots are powerful and swift, able to subdue all defilements or afflictions like Vishnu, Narayana, defeating all opponents. That is the fourth uh, initiation of enlightenment by way of the paramita of determination. So for the sutra, for the poem, this is very much about like power. But I want to give you, because again, I, I'm trying to do it all. I'm trying to do a little bit of the linguistic analysis. I'm trying to do the good Dharma talk. And I, the way that I teach virya, determination, or drive, the way that I teach it as, a, as part of the bodhisattva practice is, you know, I hope all of you watching and that in your life that you've been driven. To, to do something, 
that you've had just this kind of uncontrollable will to do something and and what we would then or what i would think of as being driven or what, what i would think of as a quality of drive or being driven is this sense that you you couldn't not do it it's like it's like this idea and and what i'm getting at just and many of you probably have heard me say this but what i'm getting at is that every every dharma student eventually has this realization and it's the this it's this realization it's such a it's such like a it, it should be one of these stages of bodhisattva-ness it's the stage when you go okay the Buddha said, desire, craving, and wanting. That act of craving, wanting, that that's the problem. That's the cause of suffering. Striving, right? Isn't wanting enlightenment then? Like, how does that work? Isn't that wanting? So that's the realization that every Dharma student eventually has isn't enlightenment also desirable in that way and therefore you know and my answer is always yeah <laughs> if you're striving and wanting it then it doesn't matter if it's a, a an ice cream sandwich or enlightenment if you're wanting it and craving it it doesn't matter what it is, that's going to be a cause of suffering, according to the noble truth. So what's going on here with determination or drive is it's kind of an answer to that conundrum. So the answer is, is that, a, you know, a bodhisattva seeks enlightenment, not because they want it, not because they're striving towards it, but because of a kind of energetic drive that in a sense, they just couldn't not be moving in that direction. But again, the idea is it's, it's not a desire in that sense. It's not a, an object that will, you know, fulfill me in some way. It's very different than that. And so the idea is, that the bodhisattva practices or observes determination or drive. And some of you might be wondering, well, how do you practice determination? You're, you're either, you're you either are driven or you're not, right? And I think that the idea here is, is that with all of these, it's, it's like, it's tricky. And what I mean is, giving. Well, how do you practice giving? Well, by doing it in that way. And what I'm getting at is, is that you may not always want to give. You may not always be feeling generous. But the wisdom is about, oh, but it's, it's wiser to be, to have a disposition of generosity. And so if you kind of catch yourself not being so generous, not being so giving in that way, the practice is to be like, hey, why aren't I being so generous? And then trying to be more generous in that way. Same thing with moral discipline. The idea here is, is that if you've, um, you've made a vow, and in that sense, in regarding moral discipline and regarding precepts, we're definitely talking about vows. And so if you've made a vow to not speak falsely, then the idea is, is that you're kind of on top of your mind. And when you notice yourself about to commit that little white lie, because it's easier, you might say, oh, well, but I'm trying to be a bodhisattva. I'm trying, I'm going for bodhi, bodhicitta here. Maybe it would be wiser for me to stick to my moral discipline and not commit that little white lie. Patience is another one you might feel the anger coming up towards the person. Again, it's instinctual. And so the idea is that it's a practice to not do that, even though we might, again, have the anger welling up. 
in exactly the same way, determination or drive is one of those things where you observe yourself. You observe when you are driven versus when you're kind of lazy in that way, not so driven. And so in those moments when you feel driven, you act upon it, seize upon it in order to, well, effectively create a good habit in that way, to create a good samskara versus giving in to a kind of laziness and then reinforcing that as your mode of behavior. So again, these are practices and observations. And by observation, I mean watching your actions and watching your mind. So any questions about determination? Again, I would like to try to get all through all 10. So I'm going to kind of move, but I have no problem stopping for as long as we would like on any of these. Everybody good with determination? Cool. So we can get to dhyana. Typically just translated as meditation. Of course, dhyana is a very kind of specific mind state, a specific kind of type of meditation in that way. Let's see about the virtuous roots required for this. So I'm going to just read from the English one quick. Uh, fifth is the vow to have overwhelming uh, sorry, sorry. Fifth is the vow to cultivate virtues and develop all kinds of good roots. That's what we're in the business of doing, which will blossom like flowering parijata and kovidara trees. This is the, the basis or the fifth initiation by way of the paramita of meditation. Or someone's virtuous roots are bursting forth <laughs> that again in within the context of the poem it's all about this person with that has cultivated these virtuous roots and it's these 10 similes for those virtuous roots and this one is saying that these virtuous roots of all kinds burst forth like heavenly parijata and kovidara trees in bloom this is the fifth initiation of enlightenment or fifth initiation of bodhicitta by way of the paramita of dhyana, meditation. So this is, of course, this kind of uh, beautiful simile of these heavenly flowers, the parijata, kovidara, are these kind of mythological trees that are, exist only in these heavenly realms. They bloom very, very seldomly, but when they do, it kind of produces these amazing smells and this amazing everything. And so all the gods look forward to the blooming of the Parijata and Kovidara trees. This, of course, is a simile that when someone is in dhyana, the sense from the poem is that their, their virtuous roots uh, you know, again, this is about somebody whose virtuous roots are piled high like Mount Maru, you know, or their virtuous roots are popping, bursting like these heavenly flowers. <laughs> and there's a lot, there's a lot, a lot, a lot that I could say about this, this simile. Um, I'm going to try to tone it down. <laughs> I'm going to try to tone my excitement down, though, uh, and just give you a few a few things to work with. Um, Dhyana, of course, is, is, has been the name of the Buddhist game since day one, that, or, and not even the Buddhist game. That's, it's been the name of the meditation game in India since day one. Um, and the one thing that I would like to, I don't know, again, I could go on and on and on about dhyana. I've done so many dharma talks about the dhyanic states, though, that I just would like to share with you this one piece of, of practice. And it has to do with dhyana within the context of the bodhisattva path, within the context of the paramitas. And what I mean by that is, you know, like I said, Dhyana has been the name of the meditation game for a long time. 
the Buddha sort of, or Buddhism sort of codified or codified these four jhanas, four jhanic levels marked by joy and these various kind of, mm, kind of psychological states in that way that progressively move towards upeksha, equanimity. That's the fourth jhana. And in many ways, the fourth jhana, equanimity, equipoise, that is sort of, you know, I never really like to talk about goals in Buddhism because I just was kind of warning against such thinking. So, but the idea here is, is that Dian, uh, sorry, Upeksha, this equanimity, it's kind of the middle path of meditation as it was being practiced in India at the time of the Buddha. And what I mean by that is, is that for most meditation traditions, yeah, you go through these jhanas, you get to Upeksha, but you keep going into Samadhi. And then you keep going through the Samadhis until you are gone, gone, or liberated, moksha, out of here. And while there is a samadhi practice in Buddhism, the Buddha sort of warned against um, kind of like a meditation practice that just keeps going and going and going, and then you're gone, like forever, which is a, a practice to sort of, I don't want to say zone out, but it, it's kind of this, it's definitely bye-bye. <laughs> Bye bye, earth. Bye bye, people of earth. I'll be in deep meditation for the rest of eternity. And that's the type of meditation that the Buddha was like, nah, we're not into complete escape into some other realm. So there is a samadhi practice, but the, the goal, as I didn't want to call it, the middle path in Buddhism is actually to kind of sit right in that equipoise, equanimous place. That is kind of like, at least from the way the Buddha describes it, it's kind of the middle path between the world of craziness and suffering and this kind of enlightened, liberated realm of the samadhis. Upeksha allows you to sort of be in the world, but not of it, as they would say, not affected by it, but still a contributing agent or member of all of this, but with your gloriously beautiful equipoise mind. So that's the way you can kind of purify this Buddha land within the Bodhisattva practice, which is by bringing your equanimous mind to the grocery store, <laughs> bringing your equanimous mind out into the world and spreading that beautiful equanimiousness. That's, that's that, fourth dhyana. But actually where I started, where I wanted to go with this was talking about a kind of, well, a type of dhyana, a type of meditation practice that is, um, it's a big part of the bodhisattva path. So the, the, what I just described about kind of going through these geonic states of, of like a joyous state, a content state, a kind of uh, very peaceful uh, content state, and then equanimous. The bodhisattva practice of dhyana is this practice of the four immeasurables as they're called, or the four Brahma Viharas. They are also a dhyana practice and many of you have probably done this practice, which is the loving kindness, compassion, empathic joy, and then equanimity. Those four Brahma Viharas, uh, or again, uh, immeasurable, immeasurable minds, that sort of is the premier bodhisattva type of dhyana. And if you're not familiar with it or you haven't done it, 
uh, very, very quickly. The idea here is, and this is just one way to do this, one way to describe it, but it's essentially about kind of opening up the heart in a kind of generous way, opening up the heart and imagining a kind of sphere of influence where you can exude out metta, loving kindness. And one practice is sort of beginning with your immediate environment and extending loving kindness out to your family or whoever's kind of in your house, but then expanding the sphere of influence to include, let's say your neighbors, and then eventually like your neighborhood and then your city, state, country, world, universe, <laughs> and you could kind of keep going with this extension of that sphere of influence of meta where you're just extending loving kindness out to all sentient beings. Then you can move into extending compassion, karuna for all, for your family, neighborhood, all the way out. And then the third uh, immeasurable is this it's sweetness, this mudita, empathic joy. You're kind of really stoked for everybody. You're kind of really joyful for everybody's accomplishments and everybody's well being. And then, through that practice of extending loving kindness, compassion, empathic joy, that practice leads one to this kind of state of equanimity or upeksha. So it's the same goal, but through a slightly different practice of extending this kind of, um, well, you know, it's kind of, if you think about it the right way, meta or loving kindness is, it's kind of like me giving you meta, like me being kind to you. Compassion is a little more selfless in that way but there's still kind of this sense of me being compassionate. Then you get to mudita where it's, this has nothing to do with me. <laughs> it's all about everybody else's joy in that way. And so that sort of process of divesting oneself of the concern for oneself alone, and op again, opening up the heart in a generous way to include others, that process is, it's kind of a super cool upaya technique, an expedient mean or a technique for divesting yourself of yourself, which is the, always the practice in a way, but this is sort of, again, just an upaya or a technique, one among many. Okay, everybody cool with Diana? Diana's like, Pretty familiar, I think. Um, oh, and the, and the metaphor of these uh, heavenly flowers bursting open. Yeah, I, again, I'm not gonna get too into that, but it's a beautiful metaphor for these kind of like, um, well, you know, what can I say? You know, it's, it's, it's so, I, you know, it, it's, the, it's the meaning of, Bud, Buddha. I always say it, you know, this word Buddha, which means awakening, awakened one, but the root of the word Buddha is Bud, where we get the English word bud. And what, when we say that a flower has budded, it has, it's open, it's these little buds. And there is this consistent floral metaphor in Buddhism of the mind opening like a flower, awakening like a flower, budding like a flower, and that makes you a Buddha, a Buddha in that way. So these heavenly flowers bursting forth, the simile of these heavenly flowers bursting forth in a dhyana state, yeah, you, I think you can start to put together where, where the poetry is, so. All right, we're doing good. Number six. And of course, there are some sutras and some traditions that stop here. There's 
only six paramitas. And so in some systems, this is the final ultimate grand daddy of all paramitas. And that's the paramita of pranya. Yeah, you could translate it as wisdom, but it's this much more exalted idea of transcendent wisdom. Uh, let's read the sutra first, and then we'll talk about pranya. Uh, this one, da, 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 sixth, is the vow to eradicate ignorance and delusion. Just as the boundless light of the sun dispels all darkness. This is the basis of the paramita of wisdom. Uh, my translation is, let's see, is it a lot different? Um, again, the way that I'm doing the translation, I'm trying to always refer it back to what the Buddha's poem is, which is that if someone has all these virtuous roots, virtuous roots that are cleared of ignorance and darkness, like the boundless radiance of the sun. This is the sixth initiation of enlightenment by way of the paramita of pranya. Okay, um, this again, pranya, this, we spent eight weeks <laughs> on a sutra dealing only with the paramita of wisdom, the pranya paramita. And of course, pranya paramita, there's a whole genre of sutras that deal exclusively with this paramita. And that's why in some systems, this is the, the ultimate paramita. Um, bec because of that long tradition of, of, of having all these sutras focused on this, that this was sort of, you know, tantamount to enlightenment in that way. Um, because we spent eight weeks on this, I'm not going to even really try to do a whole pranya talk right now. It just, uh, again, I think it would be more interesting to get some of the, to these, the other ones. I will say, I, I will say this though, because I gotta, I gotta address the poem. I gotta address the simile that this is a, uh, this pranya is like the, the radiance of the sun. You know, there's, there's a reason, there's a reason we call it enlightenment. So that the, the, the operating, you know, metaphor there, light, enlightenment, right? I want to talk about that. So, you know, I could talk a lot about pranya, this pranyana and pra. Jnana is, is, it's a form of jnana, it's a form of knowledge, but it's a very special form of knowledge. And well, again, I'm not gonna, I'm not, I was, I was about to, I was about to do it. I was actually formulating <laughs> the, the curriculum and then, no, 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 we're not gonna do that. But I, I wanna say this about this sort of this wisdom, what, what is pranya? In the, um, in the oldest Buddhist tradition or traditions, uh, pranya or panna as it was called in Pali or as it is called in Pali, th this pranya was the vipassana. It was the insight. And what I mean by that is that if you're familiar with this idea of vipassana or insight meditation and this idea of sort of gaining insight, insight, and one could gain insight regarding say the Four Noble Truths. You've, you've heard the Four Noble Truths, right? Suffering, suffering is, is caused by attachment and clinging. If you don't attach and cling, you don't suffer through various practices, meditation or contemplation or otherwise, you could have an insight where you're like, oh, 
suffering is caused by attachment. <laughs> it's so obvious, <laughs> right? And there's a series of insights that the Buddhist has regarding the Dharma, regarding these truths that the Buddha laid out, where it's this realization of like, oh my gosh, that's right. <laughs> Well, what prajna was in the old school Buddhism, prajna was the final, ultimate insight realization regarding the emptiness of all things, actually. In some traditions, it's just the Atman, no self. But if you do some digging through the Pali Canon, prajna or panna was, it's about this sort of the emptiness, shunyata, that, you know, all Buddhist traditions talk about this idea of emptiness. Now, whether we're talking about no self, the idea of anatman, no, no fixed self here, an ever-changing, morphing uh, constituent of skandhas or whatever, if you understand no self, and especially if you understand emptiness, the idea of emptiness, the idea here is, is that if you, if you really, really, really understand that, then there is this realization that there is no one and no thing that achieves or attains prajna. That's prajna. <laughs> So yeah, it's a little circular in that sense, but not if you not if you you know your dharma in that way. I did it anyways. I kind of did a prana talk that I didn't mean to do, but I I'm gonna finish it here though with the sun analogy, and why it's called enlightenment, or why maybe it's called enlightenment. There, you know that what did the sutra say about? Um, eradicating ignorance and delusion. You know, Buddhism is certainly not at all the only tradition or the only cultural tradition to think of ignorance in terms of darkness. In fact, this is pretty standard actually for most cultures to pivot these that wisdom, intelligence is sort of more luminous and light-like, and ignorance and stupidity and foolishness are more dark-like. And what the metaphor is, is being in a dark room and you can't see anything. You don't know where you are. You don't know what's going on. And then somebody turns on a light and it's, oh, I can see everything. I can see everything that was here a minute ago, but I couldn't see it a minute ago, but I can see it now. That flip from ignorance to awareness or understanding in that sense, and then this operating metaphor of light versus darkness, there's a, there's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot to meditate on and think about regarding that. And if I may, yeah, let me let me just drop this on you. This is a something. Uh, it, yeah, it's just something to think about. You can meditate on it if you like, or a thought experiment if you like. Um, and I've shared this with a lot of people. It's a way of thinking, but. You know, like I'm in a room right now, you can see the little hot spot of my lamp that I strategically placed around the Buddha's wonderful forehead there. Um, so I, got, I, have, I have lamps in this room that are allowing me to see uh, gnome, <laughs> are allowing me to see my room in this way. So the, the lamps. And if I were to have gone outside earlier today and the sun were shining, it would be the sun, the light of the sun that uh, is allowing me to see the, the trees and all of that, right? So the interesting 
uh, thought experiment or meditation is to think about a dream that you had recently or the past, but a dream that you can remember in which you were seeing things. And the question is, what is the source of illumination in a dream? Is it a little dream lamp? <laughs> is it a little dream sun? What is the source of illumination in a dream? I know you know the answer, but to really, again, meditate on that or think about that um, is very important when it comes to uh, pranya. And what I mean by that is within the, within the context of the Mahayana, the Bodhisattva path, well, if I had to just say it, I would say that the source of illumination in your dream and the source of illumination right now are actually the same. that you might think it's the lamp or the sun or something external to you. That's like being in a dream and thinking it's the little dream lamp that's lighting up the room and not really recognizing your role as creator of that dream. A similar thing, again, from a Mahayana point of view is going on here where the degree to which we are ignorant and deluded and having a subject object relationship with the world is the degree to which we think in terms of lamps and sun and things like that. But that at a much, much deeper level, the source of illumination in both is effectively the same. And what I'm kind of getting at regarding this is that in, in Buddhism, uh, I mean, I don't want to say too much I mean, in, in a sense of overgeneralizing, not that I don't want to tell you everything. I want to tell you everything, but I don't like to overgeneralize. But what I want to say is, is that ultimately the idea is, is that it is wisdom and understanding that is light-like. I, and what I mean is, is that there's this way in which there's just this interesting way in which in Buddhism, terrestrial light and even heavenly light and all of these certain forms of light are after the fact, in a sense. And that the real true source of that illumination or whatever is again the same source of illumination as in a dream and that's where you get to sort of this mm, well you know i know that you know there's uh, just a lot of popular talk about the illuminated mind or in this way the enlightened mind and i just want you to to consider Consider that thought experiment. Again, the thought experiment being what is the source of illumination in a dream? So, questions um, about pranya. Yeah, Michael, um, is it um, similar to what you just explained? This, um, um, like, in a sense of, for example, is there, I mean, we've talked about so much about it, you know, but is there a tree when there is no light that light well not that perceives the tree because then the tree must be prior to um you know the light but is there anything without the light i mean in a sense of um if there's not the light then um there's no experience or there's no perception and anything i don't know where i'm going with this um but are, you, are you speaking of Ter terrestrial light no like light in a bigger sense of the meaning mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think if I'm if I may, Connie, it, I guess the idea here. So let me go back to my original. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not. I don't think I'm going to really be able to answer your question, Connie. It's not really uh, a real question. So yeah, no, no. But I, you're you kind of what you're thinking about. I can I can address in that sense. I can offer offer something. And what I'd like to offer is if we go back to what my initial description of this idea, which was that you're you're in a room and it's completely black and you're like, just like, you know, feel trying to feel your way around. And then somebody turns on a light and you're like, oh, I can see everything now. What if there's another light? <laughs> that like, so I was in a dark room and then I turned on the light. Now I can see everything. But what if there's an even other light that would really show me what was going on? <laughs> and that's what I'm getting my at. My question. Yeah, yeah, Connie, please. Yeah, my with this example, um, prior to um, turning on the light, is there anything at all? You oh. know, if I go in a... I don't see anything, but is there an, is there something, even though I don't, there's no perception to it, you know what I'm saying? Like, or is there, are things um, appearing in the moment when there is light, you know what I'm saying? It's, I, I it's do, Connie, and, you know, as usual, the, your questions are so great and they make me, you know, they make my Kovidara and Parijati flowers bloom whenever you ask questions. Um, and, and as usual, it's like, oh, the answer I could give in, in, in an hour and, <laughs> you know, it would take a long time. Yeah. I, I, I guess part of, you know, what you can try to sort of put on here and see if it fits is Oh, it's about, oh, it's a, you know, and I, you know, I know Connie that, you know, you were here for the Pranaparamita Sutra and here for a bunch of other sutras. So I know, you know, this it's, I'm always just worried about everybody else um, kind of keeping up in that sense, but, you know, so much of what this Pranya stuff is about, like I said, is this idea of no self emptiness that to perceive uh, dualistically in terms of a subject object experience is totally delusional. It's totally, um, and if I, if, I, if I have to, if I have to, I will. <laughs> and that's, I'm going to again, bring you back to the dream, the dream state for an analogy, as an example. So you know how you're in that dream state and what's really weird about a dream is that things appear in front of you. And in fact, what's really weird is that things in a dream appear to not be you. They appear to be objects to you, the subject of your dream. But if you just stop for a minute and realize, oh, but in a dream though, I'm I'm both sides of, I'm both sides of it. <laughs> I'm the thing I think, I'm the maker of the thing that I think I'm trying to get in the dream. And I'm the person that thinks they're gonna get it in the dream. I'm both sides of it. But what makes, what make, dreams, tricky, funny, weird things is that we preserve our delusion. We preserve the sense of subject object relationship, even in a dream to the point where for no reason, there's a front and a back in a dream directionality, all of these things. Right. And so what I'm getting at is when we're deluded into thinking subject objectly dualistically in that way it's almost like i need 
a mediator now. I need the light to show me what's going on. I guess, Connie, what I'm getting at is this, what I was, um, oh, what I, what I was getting at with my dream and my initial dream analogy about what is the source of illumination. The idea here is, is, you know, Connie, your question about things, you know, existing or not existing, you don't exist. I, it's like the idea here is, is that any subject object dualistic relationship is de facto deluded, ignorant in that way. It's not actually what's going on. And it's almost like when I don't get that, then I need light, external sources of light. I don't know if that's making a lot of sense. Uh, it, it makes it makes sense. Something to ponder uh, over. For sure. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's more about just thinking about that. Th those are those are very very. I mean, we're talking about prana, so it's no surprise. But these are very very subtle ideas. It's not quite as simple as being generous. <laughs> prana is this really, you know, exalted practice of you know, self in that way, but it's also, uh, yeah, it's just, you know, again, a practice of observing the world in terms of dependent origination and therefore individually empty. And then ultimately the subject object relationship being a part of the delusion. So pranya is about observing that. And just like I was kind of saying with all the rest, I think it's about recognizing moments when you are deeply in a dualistic mode and kind of being like, well, maybe I should, you know, try not to do that. And then moments when you really, whether it's meditation or exercise or music or whatever, but those things that bring you into a, a, a groovier, less subject object relationship that could be a practice then to cultivate that way of seeing the world, if, if I may. Okay, any more questions about pranya? So here's the deal. I said these are the six traditional paramitas and these have been spoken about um, since day one. These are the practices in a way. Within the Mahayana tradition though, they speak in terms of these 10 paramitas. And mm, the one thing, I need to say this uh, before we get into these four, it, it has to do with the Bodhisattva path. And this is very much the Bodhisattva path and in a sense, it culminates. I don't want to say like as a goal or anything, but it kind of culminates in this attaining of um, omniscience, jnana, knowledge. But to translate it just as knowledge makes it sound like it's it's just like book smarts. But it's this is actually uh, omniscience. <laughs> all knowledge, right? That's where this is headed. But I, I need to tell you something about these next four, upaya, pranidana, bala, and jnana. And, and in fact, this is true, this is true of all of these. But there's something particular about, um, about these four. And what it is, is that, you know, the Bodhisattva and the Bodhisattva path is not um, interested in, per se, or directed towards one's enlightenment. I know I've been talking about Bodhicitta all night and how do I develop Bodhicitta, but in the end, this is not about my enlightenment. The Bodhisattva is actually in the business of liberating all sentient beings, like bringing to enlightenment all sentient beings. So it's a much more kind of altruistic 
task or, or, or whatever you want to call it in that way, because it's not just about you going off into a cave and working on yourself. This is this path is actually very much about being in the world <clears throat> and being generous in that world and being moral discipline, morally disciplined in that world, being very patient with the world that can be quite in, intolerable at times, being very driven in a world that might get you down. Uh, meditation, again, is personal, but as I described it, if you're doing the Brahma Viharas, you're very much doing meditation in the world, or at least kind of in, encompassing the world in your meditation. Pranya, of course, is, is, as we described, about understanding this world I'm in. And I guess what I'm getting at regarding this bodhisattva path is that once a bodhisattva is far enough along, and this sutra um, next week, not tonight, we're going to hopefully finish these up tonight, but next week and beyond, we're going to get much more into the actual stages of bodhisattva development, of which there are 10. And in a sense, they match these 10. But what I'm getting at is that in this schematic, the bodhisattva, <clears throat> upon really understanding or attaining, if I may, really understanding this pranya, once a bodhisattva has really penetrated the understanding of pranya, there's a way in which they can now be teachers. And what I'm getting at is that these four are much, uh, or these four are very much about uh, uh, pedagogy or teaching, interestingly enough. Um, and now I feel actually very quite, um, that I, I have to go through all four of these to share with you how these are our teaching techniques. So starting with Upaya, I even, I think, mentioned it already in this talk a few times, like just off the cuff, typically translated as skillful means or expedient means. Um, this is a fascinating part of the Buddhist tradition and it is this idea of that when a Buddha or a Bodhisattva who has cultivated and developed these six paramitas, they, well, actually, no, let me, I'm going to retract that. I don't need, I want to take this out of the, the Bodhisattva path for a minute. And I just want to explain to you what Upaya is. Because Upaya is, is like I said, it's about teaching. And what, in many ways, what makes a good or a great teacher, a good or a great teacher is upaya, their ability to, um, well, employ upaya. What I mean by that is, you've probably had a good teacher at some point and what makes upaya upaya is upaya is like it's, it's actually very hard to describe in a way but you can kind of explain it and it's essentially about knowing your audience it's about knowing who you're talking to and knowing like you know if you were if you were going to give a, a, a any kind of talk on anything. And let's say you are going, uh, uh, for some reason, I don't know why, you are now put into a position where you're going to give your talk, you're going to give your teaching to a room full of carpenters. It would be upayak of you, and it would be an upaya, a skillful means, if you could put what you want to say within the context of carpentry. Oh, it's like building a house. You know how you need a good foundation first in order to hold, you know, and you could develop a whole teaching special just for carpenters in order for the carpenters to understand what you're talking about. 
because it might be the case that if you're like, oh, you guys are a bunch of carpenters. Okay. It's like chemistry. It's like a, a, bun, a Bunsen B and they're sitting there going like Bunsen B, uh, burners and beakers and so what? That's not expedient. <laughs> that is not upayak. What I mean, this is the most important part of upaya. If I came up with a really, really good metaphor about building a house, and that you need a good foundation and you need a roof. And, and it was like, just like really a great metaphor. And all of these carpenters, the room full of carpenters were like, they just got it, right? If I were to go next door and say, all right, it's like a house. And everybody, cause it's a room full of chemists and they're like, huh, okay, I'm not quite following you here. You lost me. Again, that would not be expedient. The point is the metaphor of the house is not upaya. What is upaya is the teacher that knows what to use and when to use it and who to use it for. So it's a very interesting pedagogical or an aspect of pedagogy or an aspect of teaching, which is this ability to make it applicable, to make it resonate so that the person gets it. And I know from you know all my years of elementary school, middle school and high school, the good teachers were the ones that made it relevant to my life so that I could get it. The bad ones were the ones that had no upaya, <laughs> No skillful means, no expedient means. They read from the book, the same book that was the book for the last 50 years. And here's the lesson. Da, 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 da. So that's Upaya. And I would want you to also know, though, that it's more than just teaching, though. It's more than just teaching. This is about establishing like social cohesion and peace and all of that is about this kind of skillfulness, this ability to be skillful versus again, canned stock phrases, all of that. So that's skillful means. It's a practice, it's an observation, but I want you to see how uh, deeply interwoven this practices with the other. In fact, you don't, you never do it alone. You, you just, you never like, it, it's not like I'm here drawing great pictures for me, right? It's like, so it always kind of uses the, or not uses, but uh, is in relationship with the other in that way. Everybody good with Upaya? Yeah, no. I just have a quick question because I was thinking about that very thing you said at the end that, that this doesn't seem like it's just a teaching thing. It's it comes into play whenever you interact with someone. And I was thinking about the, you know, to be to be skillful in your compassion. You know, a friend comes to you with their sorrows or their troubles, and how you respond is either skillful or not. Do you, can you use upaya for that situation? I mean. Between you absolutely and yeah but it does yeah, yeah. yeah okay yeah thank you no and that's a you know that's a really great uh point gnome like regarding the practice of generosity because it, it might you know what might be what someone might need might not be money yeah. although they're asking for it yeah. it might not be this although they're asking for it or whatever and so upaya would be the, the skillful, like, um, you know, the one that comes to mind is the, you know, give, give some, uh, you can give somebody a fish or you can teach them to fish. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of thing in terms of, gen although that was a teaching one as well, but the point is the same is that in the practice of giving, it can't, it can't just be this kind of like blind giving in a way. I mean, it could be, but the idea is it's much more expedient or skillful if, if it's given with this type of wisdom. Mm -hmm. So, 
Okay. Um, I'm going to probably try to actually squeeze these three. Oh, we didn't uh, read about skillful means though. So we can't, can't do that. Here's our beautiful poem for this wonderfulness of uh, skillful means. Uh, yeah, no, I didn't like this one at all. I, I, I'm not even gonna bother, I'm not even bother. It's terrible. So, ah, right, yeah, because this one had this really, really great uh, thing. So this person whose virtuous roots are it, it's tricky but they're fully satisfied and joyful in mind each and every adornment attained like a great merchant who uses their abundance skillfully to uplift those in danger and hardship this is the seventh initiation of enlightenment by way of the paramita of expedient means or upaya. <clears throat> and the, the one interesting thing about the, the Sanskrit, the is this idea of a joyful mind. And it's an interesting idea of the, well, there's a lot I could say about that too, but it's, it's about, a, it's, it's an interesting idea about a mind that is, how can I say this, satisfied with itself. And what I mean by that is a mind that receives joy and pleasure from being a mind. It needs, it needs no supplement. For many of us, our joy and our happiness is, is dependent upon and predicated on certain things in this world. And when I get this, I'm happy. When I don't have this, I'm not happy. And so there is this idea of a mind that is, is joyful and gets ev all the satisfaction it needs from basically thinking in that way. So that's what it's referring to. And so the poem says is that if someone whose practice of you know, virtuous roots is like that to the point where their mind is joyfully content and like a great merchant who uses their wealth to uplift people out of hardship, that's the practice of upaya. Now I can talk about pranidana. I'm, I'm going to translate this as devotion. It's a tricky word. They do it as... Oh, that's right. Yeah, sadly, uh, they translate it as volition. Volition. It's not volition. It is not volition at all. Uh, pranidana is, is um, this is actually the word, if I may, this is the word that is appropriately translated as vow. Not the other thing, but this is the vow. And there's a lot going on with pranidana. The reason why I translate it as devotion is because it's very much about a kind of, well, to use some very problematic modern language, this is about um, surrendering to a higher power. That's actually what pranidana is about surrendering to a higher power. One of the original forms of pranidana is in the Ashtanga, the eight limb yoga system, which is the Ishvara pranidana. So Ishvara is this idea of the Lord, God essentially within the yoga tradition, this kind of overseer Lord being. And so Ishvara pranidana is this surrendering oneself to Ishvara. But of course, within the yoga tradition, the Ishvara is your true higher self. And the little Michael, that's the deluded, ultimately illusory self. And so by in the yoga tradition and in this Buddhist tradition, 
by surrendering yourself to a higher power, you're effectively giving up the ego deluded self to your enlightened self. But as long as we are deluded, having subject object relationships and experiences, it's helpful to then get a nice little statue or a mandala image or something and actually have a deity, Bodhisattva Buddha, that one sort of develops a relationship with. That's why I like to translate it as devotion. It's kind of like a devotional, devoted to. But I don't want anybody to think that this is um, theistic or kind of that type of religious behavior. It's much closer to the yoga tradition of that idea of surrendering the little self to the greater self. So that's pranidhana. Um, there is, there does seem to be a kind of relationship with pranidhana and prostration, which is that, I, again, that idea of surrendering. Um, da, 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 let's see. So yeah, um, I'm just going to read mine for the sake of time. I won't go back and forth. So this one, this is where it starts to get a little, a little, you know, hard to explain. But for someone whose virtuous roots are so great that their that their Buddha land and all sentient beings in their Buddha land have are all fully adorned in purity. All virtuous dharmas having been achieved, like a poor person who attains an inexhaustible treasury and can fulfill all their wishes. This is the eighth initiation of enlightenment by the paramita of pranidhana. The, uh, the metaphor of it's, it's like someone who receives an inexhaustible treasury and can fulfill all their wishes. There's a not, this is where um, English is terrible. You know, our language is so, um, uh, or a lot of our language is so Christianized in that way that it, it's difficult to use words without evoking certain ideas, but Another in the, or another part of pranidhana, and this is where it's like, wait, how does this all fit together as one idea? Another big part of this pranidhana is it's a willpower, but not willpower like we use it. Willpower like, um, well, it's this idea that basically one who achieves pranidhana, like has fulfilled pranidhana, can basically will whatever they want. And, and it's like, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> this word means surrender, devotion, vow, and will? Willpower? It means all of those together. And again, I mean, I probably, yeah, I shouldn't say much more about it, but it's this idea that, but, and so the way, if you would like, the way that you could put that together is that when you surrender your small self to that greater self, you now have willpower, but again, not like perseverance willpower, but this actual like uh, manifestation power to, to will what you would like. Now, of course, the Bodhisattva is not gonna go running around magician's apprentice, uh, uh, willing up a bunch of brooms to clean the house for him, right? This is much more about being able to change environments and make environments better for people, something to that effect. 
I'm going to quickly run through the next two because I do want to get all these in one gulp. I really would hate to pick up next week with the la like the last one. It just wouldn't make a lot of sense. So really quickly, and I already kind of uh, alluded to it, the next paramita that is developed by the bodhisattva is this bala power. Um, the Spanish word balas for bullets, bala, comes from the Sanskrit word bala, and the English word ballistic, ballistics, comes from this word bala, but they're not talking about bullets and projectiles. What bala meant is this power, and it's right up there with the willpower I was just talking about. But bala in this tradition is typically the, the siddhis, the supernormal powers. Uh, you name it, passing through solid objects, reading people's minds, levitation, uh, being able to see into the past and the future. Those are all siddhis and those are all part of bala or power. And you achieve such power by way of surrendering yourself to that higher power right but i want to make it clear that you know and if if you if you were here for the vimalakirti experience that i did with michael taft a number of months ago um or if you've just read the vimalakirti sutra the vimalakirti the layman vimalakirti is a perfect example of bala power powers within the context of the bodhisattva path because what a bodhisattva does is use these supernormal powers to um, uh, lure people over to the Dharma, basically. It's basically, it's kind of like, you know, you would show up and you, you know, you have four noble truths and suffering and this and that. And people are like, eh, that's some boring or whatever. And you're kind of like, well, I got these, uh, these great uh, mandalas. And like, eh, I'm not really into art. And so then you levitate. <laughs> and then they're like, ooh, how'd you do that? It's like, well, the Buddha Dharma. And now everybody wants to be a, be a Buddhist. So it's kind of a trick. It's actually kind of a new paya. I, I hope you're starting to see how all these actually fit together. So I just wanted you to know that while there is a, a very long standing tradition of the development of supernormal powers by way of meditation and all of this, the Bodhisattva uses it as an upaya. They don't use it for joy rides in that way. And then finally, last, and then I'll open it up real quickly for questions. The 10th paramita, the culmination of all of this is the development of jnana knowledge, but it's more correctly translated as omniscience, all knowledge. And while this is a, a, a very exalted state, tantamount to Buddhahood, tantamount to full enlightenment, insofar as it's a paramita, there is one thing that gets spoken about a lot in Mahayana sutras regarding this omniscience. And what, what it is, is this ability, of, basically the ability to read people's minds. And it's not as crazy as you would think. It's not like actual, I mean, they say it's like telepathy in that way of actually kind of being able to read people's minds, but it's a much, um, this jnana is a much deeper omniscience where it's about, you basically understand the dharma, the truth, these principles or laws, you understand them to such a clear degree that basically everything makes perfect sense because everything is operating on these principles. And as I often say regarding other people's minds, 
if you want to know how to read other people's minds, here's the trick. The Buddha taught that the, the kind of the heart of clinging, the heart of suffering is caused by greed, anger, and delusion. Those, the three poisons, the three kleshas. But not only are the three kleshas causing you to suffer, <laughs> the three kleshas, greed, anger, and delusion, are causing all sentient beings to suffer. And so actually all beings, all beings, their behavior can be understood as the expression of greed, anger, and delusion. There's not much more to it than that. And so there's this way that a bodhisattva who, again, understands these dharmas very clearly, sees all beings' behavior as so predictable, <laughs> absolutely predictable. And so why a bodhisattva would want, or not want, but this culmination in jnana, why they would want to know how where people are at is to employ the upaya and the wisdom and the giving and all the other things. So I don't want you to think that this is some sort of, you know, I don't know, tradition about, you know, becoming a god or something. Although it might sound like that in terms of omniscience and complete willpower over your environment and all of that. But I just want to remind you that this is all, at least for the bodhisattva, this is all in the greater service of serving all sentient beings. So, um, by the way, for power, it's someone who's virtuous roots where all obstructions have been removed. The mind is fully satisfied and joyfully clear like a full moon. That's the eighth paramita, or sorry, that's the ninth paramita. And then someone whose virtuous roots are, are with great fortune, great wisdom, boundless as empty space. They are like a sovereign of the Dharma, like a wheel turning sage king having been anointed. This is the 10th initiation of enlightenment by the Paramita of Knowledge. That reference to like an anointed sage turning king, it's because it is like being the god of your own world, but it is not in any kind of narcissistic fantasy land. <laughs> it is very much in an altruistic uh, uh, reality. Okay, those are the 10 paramitas in their context of the poem. Questions, answers, ideas, comments, suggestions. Thanks, Snowy. All right, then I will tell you that we are gonna keep going on. So what happens now for next week is each, each of these 10 paramitas now get a list of 10 kind of aspects to that practice. So next week, we might wind up doing 100 dharmas. So, but we'll save that for next week. Uh, thanks, everybody. I hope everybody's doing good, happy, joyful.